All right. So we are back on track one week later after episode 20. It's episode 21, which brings us another week closer to being pain-free at 100. So Dr. Mike, last week, we actually talked a little bit about some pain. We talked a little bit about some low back pain. Give us an update. How's your low back this week? Feels good. Feels good. Um, yeah, honestly, I'm in better shape than I was probably a month ago. So just to give people a little understanding of what's going on, I about a month ago got some treatment on the low back, felt pretty good. And then the irritation happened, was it last week, two weeks ago, something like that. And so I actually feel better today than I did a month ago before treatment. So very, very faint um, discomfort that, you know, I'm typically, I'm typically living with like a half a point of pain out of 10 um, on my right side. So yeah, today's, it's great. It's great. I've got no complaints whatsoever. So if I could keep this, keep it at this level of pain forever, I'd be a, I'd be a happy camper. Nice. So one of the things that we sort of talk about in, in managing these things is creating a healing environment for these things to get better in. So, you know, we're, we're thinking about how do we unload the area that is in pain? How do we unload that so that it can start washing out inflammation? It can start to heal. Um, and that comes in all sorts of forms of modification. So that could, you know, that's load management. We need to potentially do a bit less, um, probably need some manual treatment. We need a few things going on. Um, maybe another, another facet of that is about how do we, how do we minimize inflammation in that whole general area in the body in general to create that really optimal healing environment? Um, I guess one of the, one of the things that most people accept, um, around systemic inflammation is that nutrition plays a big role. Um, now, I know this is something that uh, that's kind of in your wheelhouse a little bit. You do some some work in the nutritional coaching space, um, so let's unpack that a little bit today about you know how we can potentially use nutrition um, as an angle for creating uh, you know a broader healing environment in the body when someone is trying to recover from a chronic injury. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've actually been doing nutrition work for longer than I've been doing joint health work. I work for a large multinational remote nutrition coaching company that I can't tell you the name of because it's a violation of my contract, but know that I have a uh, fairly substantial experience in, in the nutrition realm. And when you look at nutrition and, and you reflect that back into, right, our, I think this was a, this was a, couple months ago where we talked about having a diagnosis that's full in its entirety and, and we have a structural component, a functional component, a metabolic component, and a psychosomatic component. So, you know, the, the metabolic component, which can be split up into like actually metabolic diseases, autoimmune things, stuff like that, and then, and then the actual practice of your nutrition on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that if it contributes to the diagnosis, then it can then contribute to the healing environment. Um, and, and anytime you're looking at nutrition, there's largely two main components that you have to be focused on. Um, first of all is the quantity of the food and, and secondarily, and, and I do mean secondarily, I think the quality of the food comes secondary to the actual quantity of the food. And we can dive a little bit more um, into that as we proceed through this episode. But there is an optimal quantity and an optimal quality of food in general in your life relative to your body weight, relative to your hormonal health and relative to your activity level. And that ideal is then the ideal situation, the ideal conditions in order to both prevent unnecessary pain in the future and then to actually potentially alleviate some discomfort in the future. So if you take me, for example, I'm a, I'm, I'm a half a point of, uh, I'm a half a point of pain out of 10. Now, if I was 300 pounds and I was in a poor metabolic condition and too heavy, um, you're looking at that perhaps going up to two out of 10. So 
I don't think you're going to fix your pain per se by eating healthier, but you can reduce the intensity of it and or improve your threshold for feeling pain in the future with a healthy diet and a healthy metabolism and a healthy body weight. Yeah, it's a really, it's an emotive concept for people, I suppose. It's a bit like talking about religion, right? Because <laughs> everyone has kind of different, different ideas and different, um, I guess, different practices in what they're passionate about. Like, so it, it, there's people in different camps and different ways of eating and different, uh, you know, you can you got a vegan over here, a paleo person over here and a carnivore over here. It, it, it's almost getting more weird lately. Like there's, there's more extremes coming along. Um, and so some things seem to work for some people. Other things seem to work for other people, but I guess it's like the, feels like the truth is generally in the middle of it all somewhere most of the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, what works for some people may not work for other people, but the same, the same conditions work for everybody. It's just a matter of how you go and obtain those conditions, right? It's, it's about consuming a, a, a calorie balance relative to your goals and your activity level and your current body composition. And then it's about how do I make sure that you know, 80 to 90% of my foods are consumed as whole unprocessed sources, right? As close to nature as possible because we are natural beings. So uh, instinctively, intuitively, a diet containing more natural foods is going to feel better for us. So whether it's carnivore, whether it's keto, whether it's paleo, whether it's Whole30, whether it's South Beach diet, whether it's Weight Watchers, whether it's if it fits your macros, whatever it may be, eating a diet that is either eucaloric, or in a caloric deficit or a caloric surplus relative to your goals combined with maintaining a high level of food quality is what's best for everybody. Like you, you can't run away from those principles. How you achieve it is completely up to you, right? The, the, the 300 pound male that it doesn't have great insulin sensitivity, right? Doesn't have a great tolerance for carbohydrates. is going to do much better on a ketogenic or carnivore or South beach or paleo style diet than somebody who's 190 pounds training for, for 12 hours a week and has a body composition that they want to take from 15% body fat to 12% body fat. So the individual applications are unique to the person and their goals, but the basics are always the same, right? If you want to lose weight, eat fewer calories than you are burning. And, you know, it's not as simple as that because the calories will affect your, your basal metabolic rate and your resting metabolic rate. But in general, eat a little less than, than you're burning and make sure it's good food. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you want to lose a little bit of weight, go into a little bit of cal calorie deficit and, uh, and there you go. In terms of... Um, what the actual, you know, what nutrition's impact on a person's um, ability to, to heal, for instance. So in terms of what you see, um, when you're working with someone new, so like let's say patient A is maybe uh, already very dialed in with their nutrition, they're clearly very, um, you know, they're a healthy BMI, if you want to put it that way. Uh, patient B perhaps um, on the upper end of that BMI. So you can kind of, you get an appreciation for the fact that maybe they're not putting in as much effort into that side of their life. If you kind of take both of those people and start management for them in a musculoskeletal sense at the same time, like do you sort of see one get better quicker than the other? Do you think that those practices kind of play into how those injuries repair? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's night and day, but it's, you know, it's maybe dawn and, and, and midday. You know, the, the person with the elevated body mass index is, is going to present a unique set, set of issues just in a sense that they are, have more mass. So from a treatment standpoint, it's much difficult for me as a practitioner to get through that mass to actually affect the tissue that I want to affect, right? That's, that's tenant number one. Tenant number two is that individual on a day-to-day -day basis has a higher load placed on the effective joint, thus making it harder for 
that person to unload and actually heal that tissue. And we're not even getting into like the, the nuanced effects of particular foods on systemic inflammation and your omega-3 versus omega-6 ratio and all that. It's, it's purely, we're looking at it at the surface level, it's heavier people are harder to treat from a technical standpoint and they heal slower from a load standpoint. I don't, I can't put a number on it, but it's, yeah, that the person with a healthy body composition is, is just, you know, they, maybe they're fixed in six visits where the person with the heavier body composition is you know, their version of fixed um, nine visits, 10 visits. So I guess I just did put a number on it. <laughs> Do you think even uh, like if you take the, the body comp sort of stuff out so much and you can still have someone that's, you know, potentially more systemically inflamed than someone else because of the, they have poor nutritional practices, but they might not necessarily look like a big, heavy person. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, do you think that sort of, that kind of poor systemic state um, still has a, a big flow and effect to like perpetuating that chronic injury and making it harder to recover from? Yeah. It's hard to look at it in isolation and say that, you know, uh, a heavier person eating the exact same kinds of food, just in a higher quantity, um, you know, what that effect has on their, on their pain process. I mean, most of us are going to assume that the heavier person does not consume a high, a high quality diet, but that doesn't happen to be the case. Um, in, in a lot of instances from a metabolic standpoint, body fat is very inflammatory. Um, that, that's the reason why, you know, visceral fat is so dangerous is because it's, it's, it's releasing these pro-inflammatory hormones around your viscera, around your organs and, and causing all sorts of um, disease state sequela. So yeah, I mean, just being heavier is poor from a systemic inflammation standpoint. And then if you go and, and, and dive into that assumption that the heavier person is eating Kraft mac and cheese and and, and, and shit like that. And then the lighter person um, from a correlatory standpoint is, you know, eating chicken breast and, and basmati rice and, and fresh pick fucking broccoli from their garden, right? That's obviously going to have a change on that. The food quality is going to change. Um, and even the food quantity is going to make a difference. So you have the effect of the body fat in isolation. You have the effect of differing food quality, right? A natural food is going to be for the most part, less pro-inflammatory than a processed food. And then you have to really dive deep and take a look at, okay, what do the individual effects of a protein source, of a carbohydrate source, of a fiber source, of a fat source, of a trans fat source, of a sugar source, of a sugar alcohol, you have to take a look at that. And I typically focus on the three main macronutrients in conjunction with fiber as talking points for my patients, just because... I'm still a joint health professional in that sense. And yeah, I could talk to you for four fucking hours about what sugar alcohol does to your inflammation and, and, and your joint health. But it's easier for me to say, there's probably an amount of protein that you want to hit. There's probably amount of carbohydrates, probably an amount of fat, and there's probably amount of fiber that you should consume to kind of decrease the inflammatory load on your system. Yeah. Yeah, that, <laughs> the, 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 I hope that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah. This is a, it's difficult for people, I think, because it's, it's complicated. It it's is complicated as shit. And yeah. that's why there's so much mystery around it. Right. Even, even from a pain standpoint, we've already hit four tenants, right? The increased mass on the joint, the hormonal effects of lipid tissue, body fat, the effects of certain types of individual macronutrients and the effects of the micronutrients, the food quality that you're consuming. So there's four things that are coming in and, and influencing your pain. And most people are so unconscious about their nutrition that it's like, whoa, I got to worry about all of that. Kind of, right? If you're looking to set up ideal situations for, um, for healing, yes. A hundred years ago, you probably wouldn't have because you really didn't have to worry about over-consuming food because it was more difficult to obtain food, right? We don't need to get into the sociology of that. The food quality was much higher because you weren't going to fucking Wegmans or 
Jewel Osco or Kroger or whatever the hell the, the grocery store branch is in, in Sydney, right? You, you got what your butcher got from the local kill house or the local farmer. They didn't have kill houses. You got what you, what you could find from local farms and it was all high quality. But now since the availability and ease of obtaining delicious hyper palatable food is so high, we've got to worry about that stuff, right? Your, your grandparents didn't over consume food as a numbing mechanism. You didn't learn that from them. You know, your grandparents ate what they needed to and, and that was it, right? It, it, people had a greater sense of meaning so they didn't have to numb out their emotions with, with food. And now we're getting into a whole separate side of things, but you know, that psychosomatic portion of a diagnosis can actually funnel into the metabolic portion of the diagnosis, which can then funnel into the functional, which funnels into the, uh, the, the, the structural. So yeah, it's, it's fucking complicated because um, we're so food ignorant, but food is so readily available. Yeah. And it's confusing. <laughs> like, it, it, it really is. And, you know, like we were talking before we started this this morning, um, we were talking about like sleep hygiene and, and things that you can do to, to kind of improve sleep to then sort of, you know, build into this healing environment idea and, it's like, how far do you want to take all this? Uh, and, and that's, that's got to be part of where people get lost in all of this. Cause it just, there's so, it's not as simple maybe as it was a really long time ago, right? There's just, there's so much to consider, so much to think about. And uh, you can probably just get lost down the rabbit hole with, with trying to go too far with a lot of this stuff. Um, in terms of like basic kind of starting points um, for someone that, you know, potentially they've got like a, a long-term injury and they're thinking about um, what can I do a little bit better um, to support getting better from this and setting myself up for success in the future. You know, I'm interested in being pain-free at a hundred. Um, what's a couple of key sort of starting points that, um, that you kind of throw out there for, you know, for some of your coaching clients or for some of your patients or, you know, just a, at a very kind of baseline, I'm sure these are, these are probably going to be pretty, pretty obvious. And most people kind of go, yeah, okay. I've heard of that before, but you know, what really makes sense um, to move the needle? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to kind of create this generalized avatar, you know, in my head to just to kind of frame myself around this, but it, First of all, you know, improve your food quality as, as much as possible. Cook as many meals as you possibly can yourself. Try to shop around the edges of a grocery store. Don't try to dive into the middle too much. That's where the process shit lies. And if you really follow those two rules, you'll largely take care of your food quality, right? Fresh meats, fresh cheeses, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. You dive into the middle to maybe go get your, your rice or your pastas, or whatever source of carbohydrates that you get. And you know, if you can, if you comprise your diet of mainly those foods, your food quality is, is going to be relatively high. If you want to take that next step, you're obviously looking at, you know, grass fed beef, you're looking at organic fruits, organic vegetables, things like that, that will then, you know, decrease that level of processing uh, even more. You don't want to run away completely from processing because it's, it's just not practical in a sense. Um, you know, your protein shake is fucking processed, but <laughs> right. The, 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 you know, the, the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. So it's, it's finding that balance. That would be tenant. Number one, tenant. Number two is find a basic calorie calculator that will pump out some macronutrients for you and just try them out for a couple of weeks right? Because if we're looking at specifically tissue healing or maintaining healthy tissues, you want protein because protein is going to provide you with the building blocks of lean tissue, right? If you're repairing tissue, you need the protein there to prevent too much breakdown, to prevent the adhesion, to actually go in there and repair the tissue. When we go and we break through that adhesion, you want protein. Um, you want carbs to kind of promote a, a, an anabolic state so we can we can build tissue you want carbs to then be shunted into your muscles to provide adequate energy through glycogen stores things like that right we can't forget that carbs or muscles really really like carbohydrates so if you're using your muscle a lot 
and you're potentially accumulating a load that's going to cause adhesion, you want enough energy for that muscle to actually contract and relax really, really appropriately, really efficiently, really nicely. Um, for fats, you want to make sure that there is an adequate amount there so that we can repair membranes. We can make sure that our endocrine system is healthy, right? Like you're, you're going to develop adhesion faster if you're fucking, you know, you don't have enough testosterone. You know what I mean? It, your sex drive is low. Your, your hormones are low. Everything is low. Eat a little bit more fat, ramp that up, be in good shape. The quality of fats is, is, is really, really important in my opinion, because what people don't understand is when you eat a steak, right? The, the, the fat, the property of those steaks gets broken down and then it actually gets re-implemented into the cell walls. And when you break down those cell walls, the quality of those fats is, 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 is what's released. So when you talk about like omega-3 versus omega-6s versus omega-9s, you want anti-inflammatory fats, not, not, overly because you can actually fuck it up if you get too anti-inflammatory but you want there to be a correct ratio of pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory fats in your cells so that when those cell walls do break down and those fats get pushed into your bloodstream it's a little bit more complicated than that but we'll, we'll leave it there you don't want this huge hormonal inflammatory cascade happening you want some of it because otherwise you won't heal but you want it, what is it goldilocks and the three bears where, where yeah, you, you want, want it just right yeah you want it just right and you accomplish that just right by consuming high quality meats um and, and things like that you know you're not you're not having an entman's cake and thinking yeah this fat's gonna be great to break down in my cell walls later as i deadlift no you want to go and talk to your local cattle rancher and be like was were you nice to this cow before I, you kill it and I eat it or whatever it may be, right? And you've got to be careful about that too, even in veganism, right? Because you, you still need an adequate amount of protein and an adequate amount of fat if you're a vegan, a vegetarian, whatever it may be. So you, you don't want to search out processed versions of that um, either. So yeah, stay around the grocery store find a basic macronutrient calculator, figure out what your caloric goal is relative to your actual life goal and, and make sure you're eating not too many of those macros to actually promote fat gain because we've already talked about the plethora of issues that that, that causes, but you want to eat enough to actually influence a positive healing environment in your body. Yeah, I've played with macro calculators <laughs> for a while. Um, I found it really tedious actually at first, I must admit. Um, and then it just be kind of, it kind of became a bit of habit after that, I think. Um, but yeah, it's a bit like what we were talking about with the whoop stuff too. You can kind of, um, you can get a bit lost in the, in the details and, you know, it's like, Oh shit, I'm not going out for this meal because I can't calculate the macros in it. So I'm going to, I can either bring my own or I'm just going to stay home, <laughs> you know? Well, so, some, some, some people need that much more than others. Yeah. It's a behavioral thing sometimes too, right? Right. Like if you're 300 pounds and you're dying and your knees are degenerating and your back is degenerating and you're, you're a shit show from a metabolic standpoint, you shouldn't go out to dinner. It's literally going to save your life to not go out to dinner. Like, I'm sorry if that, if that's you and you need to hear that, but you shouldn't, if you're Chris and you're like, Oh, well, do I want to hit the macros and, and go from 13% body fat to 11% body fat? Like you got to weigh the pros and cons of that. For me, there was a point in my life when I was like, can't go out to dinner. Right. I want you to be able to, to, to literally ski down my abs. Like it's a fucking moguls run at your local market. And my fiance appreciated it. But my fiance also appreciated going out for Indian food, right? Which I was like, I don't know how to calculate these macros, man. What is yeah. this? Did, you, did, did you put coconut milk in here? Oh, Where does a butter chicken fit in my macros? Okay. I'm going to, oh gosh, this is going to put me in such a pro-inflammatory state tomorrow that my big toe is going to be hurting. I just, uh, I can't handle, right? There's a balance and, and it's, it's in an individual basis. Yeah, like, just like we say, you know, if you're a police officer and you've got plantar fasciitis or fasciosis, 
I don't, I don't give a fuck if Jesus comes, or Santa Claus comes to town. Like you better get in because it's potentially life or death for you or a soldier or something you know, like it, 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 the, the, <laughs> the severity of the issue is it just depends on what you need it for. If you're a, I don't know if you're a school teacher and you have plantar fasciosis and you're like, Oh, actually, no, I have, um, yeah, I've got to get a haircut next week. I can only make it once a week. I'm going to be like, you're stupid, but fine. Right. The police officer, I'm like, I don't care. Get in here or can call your wife, tell her you can't make it, call your husband, tell him you can't make it. This is a big deal. Right. Oh, but I, I got to go to my kid's fourth grade musical play. Nope. Sorry. Sorry. You want to go home to your kid, right? I mean, I hate to be dramatic about it like that, but it's always relative to what you're asking your body to do and relative to the current state that it's in. So, so we're a little bit off, uh, off, tro- <laughs> off topic today, um, but it's an aspect of creating a healing environment. Um, and there's other things that can plug into that. We could start talking about hydration. We could start talking about sleep hygiene and, and all these things and, we talk about this shit off camera as well because it's it's interesting. But um, yeah, I think this is this is an important one uh, because it's confusing. I mean, we're sitting here having this conversation, and you know, I'm just kind of sitting here playing uh, playing audience and listening as well. And you know, I, I think you made some really good points, but you could go off on tangents with any of this stuff and it becomes just it's information overload. And you, if you go out there and you try to, as an individual, you go and try to indi- individually research some of these things and these ideas and you just get taken off on crazy tangents and it is confusing. And especially depending on where you're starting from and wanting to make some changes, uh, it's almost like, fuck, I give up. <laughs> What do I do? Yeah. You know? If if you've listened to this podcast and you're like, um, I don't. Uh, all I know is that I don't know. Then it's worked. This pro- this podcast has functioned to steer you in the right direction. Find yourself a nutrition coach. Find yourself a clinical nutritionist. If it's the guy at your CrossFit gym, whatever doesn't matter. Don't care. As long as they're not dogmatic about a particular approach chances are you're going to satisfy enough of the principles that we talked about at the beginning of this episode to put yourself in a better position to either change your body composition, prevent pain or reduce pain. Well, there we have it folks. We've, uh, we've, we've taken a chance today and uh, we've branched out from musculoskeletal, but we're plugging into musculoskeletal because we're, we're looking at ways to, to be, contributing to being pain-free at a hundred and um, you know, what goes into the body and assisting to create that healing environment to get better from your injury so that you can live longer and get the most out of your joints is, uh, is a big part of it. So anything else to close us off, Dr. Mike? I think I talked enough today. <laughs> All right. Well, let's call it. That's episode 21 in the books. We'll be back in the chair next week. We'll see you soon folks. Boom. Um.